Let's get underway. I am super excited uh, for today's Logic Live. We're doing something a little different today. We are doing a uh, tech talk. And uh, before we get started, or actually the first uh, uh, of many things I'd like to announce today is uh, we have a sponsor for Logic Live. So I wanna uh, thank or welcome uh, to the party here, our friends at Synesis Oceana. Um, these guys have been my reseller for almost 15 years and they have always been huge supporters of Logic and the Flame community. They host our user group in New York and they host user groups in Dallas and Chicago, Atlanta and Toronto, and, and maybe even more that I've forgotten, uh, forgotten about, but they've always sponsored our One Frame of White um, contest. And, uh, and I have absolutely uh, nothing but love for these guys at Synesis. Uh, if the Synesis Oceana provides solutions to keep teams connected and working. Find out more about their remote workflow solutions at synesis.io. Synesis Oceana, supporting flame artists since 1997. Love those guys and thank you for supporting uh, Logic Live. Uh, a little uh, community shout out here. Uh, for the second year in a row, our friends at Autodesk have put the one frame of white winner onto the flame splash screen. So if you fire up the new 2021 release, you'll see a frame from last year's winner, which was Hope by Parag Jambekar from Mumbai. So congratulations again to Parag and thank you uh, everybody on the dev team. Uh, this is always just a treat to see. And uh, I know I got an email from uh, Parag when he, uh, uh, he actually got contacted by a bunch of, of colleagues over there um, to let him know that this was the splash screen. He had no idea it was coming and he was super excited. So thanks everybody. Um, next up is Logic Fest. Today is the deadline, tonight rather, is the deadline uh, for Logic Fest entries, 11.59, 59 p.m. Already gotten a bunch of absolutely great uh, little tips and tricks, and I wanna thank everybody who's contributed so far, but again, it's, it's not too late. So if you would like to contribute to Logic Fest this year, um, go to oneframeofwhite.com or logic.tv and sign up, and then email your tip, trick, or technique to nyflameusergroup at gmail.com by 1159 59 tonight and uh, the logic users are going to get to vote for their favorites the five entries that get the most votes will each receive a one-year license of sapphire and mocha not either but both a courtesy of our friends at boris effects uh, i don't know how many of you caught their uh their announcement of uh, silhouette paint uh for ofx uh, but they uh they're going to be showing it off uh, on their like virtual nab webcasts um, tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, I'm gonna be on the panel tomorrow. Uh, so definitely head on over to borisfx.com and check out how you can register for that. And, and I believe they're gonna be giving away a bunch of stuff as well. And the winners for Logic Fest are gonna be showcased on the Up Close and Personal with Flame webinar that our friends at Autodesk are gonna be uh, running on Tuesday, April 28th. Uh, you can get the sign-up link for that uh, at logic.tv in the events page. I'll also put the link in the chat here today. Uh, so definitely sign up for that. Um, uh, they're going to show off all the new stuff for Flame 2021. And uh, that's it for my intro, except now it's time for me to introduce my two guests for today. Uh, my two guests are very well known in the Logic community. First up is Jack Horrocks from Sydney, Australia. Uh, where it's something like 2.15 in the morning on Wednesday uh, there right now. Uh, so thank you, Jack, for getting up so early for us. Uh, Jack's always answering tech questions on Logic and is always happy to help out. He's the flame tech himself. And uh, my second guest needs absolutely no introduction, so I'll give him one anyway. Um, when he's not advising NASA or prank calling conspiracy theorists, Alan Letary is co-founder and lead VFX artist at Instinctual in Los Angeles. Alan is easily one of the most generous people I've ever met in the Logic Flame community, constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible and then sharing that knowledge on Logic and on his YouTube channel, which you can find via logic.tv. Ladies and gentlemen, the hardest working man in show business, I give you Alan Letary. So let me stop sharing this blank screen and bring on the boys. All right, unmute you too. Hi, Alan, how you doing? I'm well, thank you. Wonderful. And Jack, how are you doing, man? Hey, not bad. Excellent. Thank you both for joining us today for a little tech talk. You know, I figured uh, uh, with so many people working from home now, um, it's kind of more important than ever that uh, we 
figure out ways to keep our systems running and, uh, and running smoothly. And uh, I've gotten, you know, I, I also have seen a, a bunch of things on Logic, a bunch of posts constantly of people asking, you know, what's the best config I should buy? What's the best machine I should buy? If I was going to do this or that, how should I do it? And so I wanted to have a little session here where people could, could ask some questions. You guys could give some answers and some advice and, uh, and we'll take it from there. Um, you know, I did get uh, a, a few kind of questions uh, uh, ahead of time, which was nice. People emailed them in. And so uh, I wanted to start out with those and get your feedback on them. Um, the first one is um, about buying a machine to run Flame or Flare on at home. Um, and the question that you see, you know, it always ignites a debate uh, on Logic is, should I get a Mac or should I get a Linux machine? And I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, on that. So why don't we start with you, Jack? I like if you spend all of your time in batch and doing big trees, you want a Linux box. I know everyone's like, I need to do both. But if you are going to be straight comping, you need a Linux box. If you're going to be doing dev work for pitching, things like that, get yourself an iMac Pro and then you can do both but don't expect a mac to be able to punch through comps all day every day the way a linux box wants like everyone i speak to who bitches to me about their machine crashing their machine not working properly is usually pushing big comps on a Mac. Now, uh, Jack, do you think that uh, that has to do with just uh, like, is there anything you could do with a Mac config that would alleviate some of that, whether it's storage no. or RAM or anything like that? Nothing. It's, it's all about if you want a Land Cruiser, get yourself a really big Mac, Mac setup. I'm iMac Pro. Um, Mac Pro, it'll get it'll get you ninety five percent of the way there. If you want a Unimog, which is a really big, powerful uh, Mercedes, it won't get you there f faster. Like the iMac Pro or the Mac Pro will get you there a lot faster. But once you try to overload it, it just dies. Whereas the Linux box just keeps on trucking. Alan, let me ask you about this, the same question. For me, it would come down to if you have any technical skill or desires whatsoever, because if you don't, then the easiest thing is going to be a Mac. But if you have a little bit of technical skills or the desire to learn and the desire to have to be responsible for some of these things. We're building Z840s with P6000s for about $3,500 right now. And I think that would kick the shit out of an iMac Pro and certainly probably be quite a bit cheaper, at least somewhat cheaper. But you are into a certain level of maintenance that somebody might not want unless you go through a reseller, but you probably won't get those prices through a reseller. Gotcha. Is there like... Um... Uh, if you were just going to stick with the like the the straight up Linux, uh, config that you can that uh, that is recommended by Autodesk, right? If you were to buy a, a, one of the HP Z series, um, and you were kind of just running your machine at home, you didn't you weren't running two flames. You needed to worry about networking. Mm -hmm. You weren't trying to print from it or hook up a webcam or you know whatever. Is um, is it as scary as people think? No, it's not as scary as people think. Autodesk only has made it, I, I think, actually quite easy with some really good documentation and their OS installer and application installer is nowhere near like it was on the SGI or even uh, 10 years ago um, when they first started Linux. So I don't think it's as scary as that, but it's definitely more than a Mac, right? It's, it's not, you just double click and it, it works. Well, the thing to be said about that is like, the amount of support I give to each Linux box 
is probably between, let's talk US dollars, is probably 1,000 to 1,500 a year. Um, and guess what? If you're twice as productive, you can make a hell of a lot more money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Productivity factors a lot into that. Yeah, productivity is the key here. Yeah. Don't think about what you actually spend straight up. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how much you actually make because, you know, that's the key. It is not about what you spend on the gear. Look, you've got an iMac 5K sitting next to it. That's where you do your email. That's where you do, you know, a quick after effects thing. The box you spend the most time on, make sure it works properly. Make sure you can pump out those shots um, or timelines or whatever. It's like, like if you're worried about if you're going to spend a thousand dollars on someone to help you to make sure that it works, that's not it. If you can make 10 grand or 50 grand extra, that's what you want. Let me ask you a couple of, a couple of little follow-ups here that have come in uh, either from chat or that I got uh, emailed ahead of time about the Linux um, configs, right? I have a uh, Kino here in the chat is asking, he's saying he's thinking of putting in two RTX 2080 TIs in his Linux box. Um, does anybody know if this has been tested? Don't do it. Get a really big one card, like an RTX 5000, RTX 6000, RTX 8000. You only want one card. Once you go to two cards, like, like I tested it and guess what? No one really worked it out, but one card big works really well. Yeah. None of our machines have dual uh, GPUs. We, we have a, a very significant burn render farm to offload processing and uh, we, we don't do any of the background reactor stuff. What about? It was I, I think some some idea. people are under the interpret under the misguided um, interpretation that having two cards, they will participate with each other to make it faster, a single a single operation faster, and that's not how Flame works. So I find no. it of of no benefit. And I've seen so many people post stories of background reactor, and it's been a while, but stories of background reactor corrupting renders are just causing all sorts of havoc. So we just built ourselves a really good burn farm. Yeah, and I mean, there is always the the the, uh, the concern, and I'll throw it out there, um, because someone should say it that you know if you there are certain cards that are recommended uh, in the system requirements from uh, from Autodesk, and even if you do get it to work, uh, it's something that's not uh, spec, you know, you're not there's no guarantee that it's going to be supported for uh, you know for when you install an update or, or anything like that. I, it all works. Look, anyone who tells you that. A lower end card doesn't work. It does. The only problem is, is that if you expect everything to work, like it doesn't. And what I've found is, is like if you're a single person and you can troubleshoot your own setups, AKA you don't click the same three buttons after it crashes every time you can go with the lowest card you can find. But if you expect that it works like it says on the box, get a supported card. Well put. Um, uh, Mark, Mark Wellington brought something up in regards to Z840 and the power supply. And I'd just like to say, if you are gonna be buying your own Z840, it's offered with two different power supplies. I think one is 850 watts and the, 11, uh, the other I believe is 1150 watts. Uh, you always want to go with the bigger power supply. And also it happened once we bought a Z840 and it came with a motherboard with only three GPU power cords, or sorry, with only two GPU power cords. 
which indicated that it was actually a motherboard for the smaller power supply, even though the reseller had yeah. put the bigger power supply in. So you always want to make sure that the, the motherboard you get has the three GPU plugs because that indicates it's a motherboard that was built for the larger power supply. You cannot port a a a big GPU into the 850 watt. It doesn't even boot. Yeah. Gotcha. Anybody, uh, let's see, I got another question here about running um, Flame and Resolve on the same Linux system. Um, is, All of our is, machines have every application installed on them, which includes Maya, Flame, Resolve, and Nuke, and Mocha. I think on the application side, that that's it. So yes, you can run everything on anything. Yeah. And Fred just brought up that uh, background reactor works on Linux with a single card. Yes, it does. That's why you want a big one. Yep, I used it today. <laughs> Loved it. Uh, is there any any uh, any other issue or anything else to consider with uh, if, if you are going to run Resolve and Flame on the same machine? Any hardware? No, that's it. It's it, it it all works fine now. For yeah. a while, like a couple of years ago, Flame was using a very old GPU driver, so there were issues at that time. But Autodesk has resolved that, and they're on one of the most current drivers now, so it's all good. Yeah. Just make sure you've got a dongle. Yeah. Be, because I use Resolve as a massive Swiss Army knife just to be able to get whatever shitty media format you get from the rest of the world. That's what Resolve's for. It's got every codec known to man in it, and it works well. I don't know if it's, uh, it makes me happy or sad to know that uh, the entire world is dealing with shitty codecs <laughs> and things that come from from clients. So at least we're all suffering yeah. together. I guess there's some, there's some solace I can take in that. Yeah. And on top of that, while I'm at it, I'm not a big fan of drastic media and I'd rather buy a copy, a copy of Resolve rather than pay them. Yeah. Drastic is a, I call them a jokey company. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I tried to build a, a complete transcode workflow with them. And then they uh, went out to visit a client and they never called me back ever. So yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to the flame stuff. Yeah. So, so Kino's asking about deck link and Aja cards in the same machine. And well, I, I've never tried running them simultaneously I've, resolve and flame. Um, I've, and done both. I've done okay. both. Um, these days, look, I love Aja. If you need something to be, you know, 100%, never, never crash, never, never die, go in Aja. But realistically, Black Magic, um, a card that costs you four, five hundred bucks, um, does 4K. Um, That's the future. Yeah. It's problematic with Luster because Luster will only ever support Aja right. cards, unfortunately. Luster, but... Luster is a different story. And, you know, once you go down that, that Luster path, it's Aja only and a big set of panels. I've got two sets here. Um, you know, um, it's better in some ways, but then I can also tell you from supporting Luster, um, it causes a lot of tears. <laughs> this is not only <laughs> tech talk, it's straight talk with Jack and Ellen. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> totally. Um, all right, shifting gears a little bit here. Uh, I got a question here from Mindy in New York, uh, who wants to get, uh, who's interested in uh, some storage options for um, a Mac. So Promise Pegasus versus Thunder Bay Raid SSD. Your thoughts? My thoughts are if you don't uh, want to 
mate, like you've got two choices here. You've got RAID protected versus just a bunch of NVMe SSDs that are as fast as hell. Um, make sure your source media is backed up somewhere else and you get one of these little boxes, you put four NVMe SSDs in it, it'll do like five gig a second. But if it dies, it dies. Whereas with the Pegasus, you fill it full of, you know, reasonably fast disk or SSDs, you'll get about three gig a second and it'll be protected. But it will cost you about three times as much. Um, personally, I go for the NVMEs these days and just make sure that my source footage is backed up somewhere. Alan, you got anything to chime in on that one? No, I, I don't know the state of the art on the Mac. Everything we do is Linux, so I, I don't know. Gotcha. Um, is there anything you guys would recommend uh, in terms of keeping your system at home uh, running smoothly? Any best practices? Oh, for me, it's not just even at home, but obviously I work in a studio level environment. Uh, we break up our frame store into as many stone partitions as is allowed, which is eight. You have zero through seven. And then we try to spread our projects between those. Uh, so some stone partitions have multiple projects, but um, the theory behind that is if one database get, gets corrupted, it doesn't take out your whole frame store. It just takes out the projects that were in that database. Um, so that's proven really good for us. There was one time actually recently where a database did get corrupted, but all the projects that we had in that stone were, um, they were junk projects. We didn't care. We could lose them and we did. We just like, forget it. We just deleted that database and started over. Um, but that helps to spread the load for and prevent a lot, you know, corruption in many different ways. So that would be my biggest um, recommendation is to do that, create all your stone volumes and spread your stuff throughout that. And then, I'll, of course, run Vic as much as you can, at least once yeah. a week. Um, for me, like, Alan's got a, a larger facility. For me, working with a lot of people at home is archive. Just mm. get the shit off your system. Put it onto a drive. If it doesn't need to be there, get it off. Um, like leaving stuff around for a producer to come back to you in three months time is bullshit. Just archive it, get it off there. You know, if they come back to you in, let's say a month, six weeks, Oh, we want to make this tiny change. It's like, well, that's going to take a couple of days. If they whinge at that, just go back straight at them and say, well, you didn't call me for six weeks. You know, we all know about the job where the producers told us that they're going to come back tomorrow and it's still on the system 18 months later. Just get rid of it. I need to have you talk to my clients, Jack. <laughs> um, anything else in terms of, uh, well, since you mentioned archiving, um, yeah, I've had a couple of questions here uh, about archiving options. Again, thinking about like the single user at home, um, it, it's, it's unlikely okay. that the person at home is going to have uh, an LTO machine or an LTO drive in a library. Um, what, what are your thoughts I, archiving, on that? To, archiving to drives is okay um, and that's fine because most of the stuff that we actually do like is a fish wrapper right if it's something which is going to come back and you know it's going to come back what I mean by know it's going to come back you are actually going to get paid to recut what you've done, then create a couple of archives, create a file archive, which has just got the setups and a full archive so that 
you completely covered. But most of the time we're just archiving just in case something comes back. Like the amount of stuff that actually comes back is probably 15 to 30%. The rest of it, we never see again. So you got to look at what you're actually working on and if it will come back. Yeah, we had a we had a like a deep philosophical conversation at our company a few years ago about the difference between disaster recovery and archiving. You know? Yeah. Like so if you want to do a nightly archive just in case when you wake up in the morning nothing's there, that's not an archive. That's disaster recovery. You know, you you don't need the one from exactly. 2 days ago necessarily. Uh and then when the job is exactly. done, you archive it and throw it in a box and put it in the shelf and lock the door, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and something that, well, you brought it up for me. Um, when you're at home, always do a file archive, set up archive. Do one three times a day. That just means that your work, which you're working on at the moment, doesn't get lost. Is there any, any drawback to doing a command line archive or any advantage to doing a command line archive over using the UI? No. Again, thinking about somebody at home, Nothing. you know, like at our studio, we yeah. have a script. Or at archive at or home, no, no, no. Just, you guys have got to do the archive. Like I hate doing command line archives because I don't know what the job is. And I don't know how to actually control the job. I can't, I can't go into the project and see if it's actually good. Um, that is one of the things which I hate when someone says, I oh, just archive it and then blow away the box. No, the operator has to actually check the job with archiving. So that's why I'm not a big fan of command line archiving because I can archive something. Sure. Do I know if it's actually good? No. Remember the good old days when uh, you were going to kick off an archive overnight and you'd leave like the corner of a book on the enter key on your keyboard so that it would hit skip all every time, <laughs> every time the oh, prompt exactly. came up, you know, at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The good old days. Um, shifting gears here, Alan, got a question for you from Jeff here in chat. Is there a secret to getting Wacom pressure to work on RGS? Client has to be Linux. <laughs> yep. There you go. So the client has to be Linux, but both both ends of the of the uh, the config. So Linux, if you're right. running a Linux at, uh, at at the office, then your remote system has to be Linux as well. Yep. Gotcha. Exactly. Could you run like, uh, and I might be talking completely. I'm a, a crazy person here, but what if you were to like run uh, um, like a virtual machine on your, your Windows system uh, and then you ran RGS in that? You know, like that's possible. It's, that's something I've never explored, but it's, uh, it's possible. You'd also have to then pass through the USB Wacom from the Windows machine to the Linux yeah. virtual machine. And that's possible, but I don't know. It's easier just to dual boot or some situation like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe or some little like a uh, tiny machine, or build a tiny machine like Alan has. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Gotcha. Um, question, questions just about are coming in the chat here, just about like remote viewing. If you want your clients to watch what you're doing at home, or you know, watch what watch what you're doing from home while they're sitting at home. I think are we talking about broadcast out or the GUI monitor? If we're talking about broadcast out, that's different than the GUI monitor. Okay, then let's start with broadcast out. So you could do something paid solution like Streambox, which is going to be your pain to or to deal with. Um, you can do an open source like I've demonstrated. Um, the other thing you could do is get some type of SDI to USB uh, device, and then those generally emulate a webcam. And at that point, you could use pretty much any video conferencing software like Zoom or uh, uh, Jitsi Meet or any web-based, anything that 
just expects a webcam if you get an SDI to USB converter, they, 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 that'll work. Um, and you can get full uh, HD resolution. The Blackmagic Web Presenter, I think that's limited to 720p. So if you yeah. want it full, yeah, so if you want it full HD or, or in fact some of the devices do um, DCI 2K SDI, which is 2048 by 1080, you can even do that. And that's what I would recommend. Anything as WebRTC is going to be really low latency in response to John's question about what's the best for low latency. I don't know the latency on Zoom, but it seems pretty low also. Zoom's pretty good. Yeah. But the key is you want something that emulates a webcam because then you could use it with anything. Um, I've heard Zoom might be compatible with DeckLink cards, actual DeckLink cards, but I've not tested it ever, and, and I have no need to. Yeah, and I know I just I just updated Zoom the other day, and it broke uh, <laughs> my webcam that I had set up through OBS, where I just stopped okay. recognizing it. So yeah, uh, I guess as they're as they're um, addressing their uh, very very. Uh, widely and passionately publicized uh, security concerns. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're doing yeah. things like just you know well. cutting out any kind of uh, while well, they're cutting out anything left and right. So, but I know we've done some remote sessions with Zoom where we had the client view uh, the Flame UI, and uh, and I you know, to be honest, for what it was, it was great. You know, <clears throat> but what about for uh, if you wanted to share the Flame UI, what would you recommend? Oh, I don't know. Uh, RGS is the thing we use. RGS as a collaborative mode, but again, you would want to be on because uh, there's two different modes of sending with RGS. There's one call that's advanced video compression, which is basically an H.264 stream, and then the other is using um, what they call HP3, which I don't know what that is, or JPEG lossless. So imagine it's just a series of JPEGs. Um, if you are enable, if you enable ABC cannot collaborate uh, with a Mac client because the Mac doesn't have AB ABC built in. I would, so you'd have to... I, would, I would just use any desk. Yeah, like, there you go. If, if, like, like if people want to see the GUI, um, they can see it, but it really doesn't mean anything yeah. to the client. Yeah. You know, like, like at the end of the day, all the client wants to see is pretty pictures. Um, they don't want to see what, what Alan's, you know, drawing masks yeah. or, or I don't you. know, man, I've watched Andy? Alan draw masks and it's, it's, <laughs> it's intoxicating. <laughs> maybe, maybe I was intoxicated is what I meant, but you know what I mean? Well, you know, look, look, if you're on the client couch without a glass of wine, uh, scotch or various substances, um, you're on the wrong couch. You're not doing it right. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let's see. Next question I have for you guys is um, thoughts on ultra grid. This is coming from Dave Robinson in the chat. I know, Alan, you've been, yeah. uh, you've been doing some stuff with ultra grid. You've posted it on your yeah. YouTube channel. Yeah, it works. It's good. It's, it's the closest thing uh, that I've found to uh, Streambox analog and it's open source, so it's, it has a lot of promise. There's a lot of things you could do with it if you're creative with it. Yeah, it's it's a it's a question of how much time you have compared to, you know, how much you want to pay. Yeah, like all exactly. of this stuff, you know, all of this open source stuff, it's free. It's great if you've got the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Never forget how much it costs you to actually implement a lot of this stuff. Do the cost, the cost thing. If I'm going to spend 20 hours on it, is that 20 hours which I could have been making three times as much? You know, um, that's the big thing between the open source stuff and what you pay for. Um, what about, uh, I got a question here from Rohan uh, about using uh, some shared file services like uh, Dropbox and things like that in terms of uh, sharing um, 
setups and or maybe archiving to one of these services. Uh, is there any any anything you can comment on uh, on using one of those? It's perfect. You've just got to make sure that you realize that like putting stuff up to a lot of these services is fast. When you access it today or next week, it's fast. A couple of months later, when you try and drag it back, it's slow. And you go, why is it fast now? Why is it slow in a couple of months? It's because they archive it. Because they don't expect you to actually want it again. So just watch out for that. Gotcha. Well, that actually explains something that happened to me two days ago. I was trying to just make a local copy of all the stuff I've ever put up on Dropbox for the um, one frame of white and the user groups. It, it was a maybe a couple hundred gigs and it was going to take something like 11 days for it to copy down yep. you know, from Dropbox. So that I was, I thought, I mean, exactly. I, I, uh, I pissed off my whole family by rebooting the Wi-Fi router in the middle of a lockdown <laughs> to see if that would help. And uh, apparently I'm relieved to know it wasn't me. From yeah. Where? Yeah. I definitely, all of these services, they, they don't tell you about what happens once something's been up there for like more than probably a month. They just deep archive it down to tape because that's cheap. Gotcha. I have, uh, you know, something uh, that I could share here. Let me bring up my screen just to, for people running your Mac, running Flame on a Mac at home, especially if you work uh, at a facility where you have a Linux machine. Um, this is a, a good one here. Let me just share the, share the screen. I didn't know about this until I started doing um, until I started doing uh, the Python scripting. But uh, if you launch Flame from a terminal here, here you'll get uh, a console like you get on your Linux system uh, at work. So if you just go to opt Autodesk, and then I'm gonna show Jack here how many versions of Flame and Flare have installed so he can <laughs> give his next tip. Um, but if I go to like Flare 2020, dot two here and go to uh, bin. So this is the whole, whoops, sorry. This is the path here. Go to opt Autodesk, the version of your software and then bin. And if you dot, do dot slash start application, whoops, I said start application, then uh, you'll launch uh, the app from the, uh, whoops, hold on, hold on. You'll launch the app from the uh, terminal. Well, you just saw a live fail. Huh? This is live here, people. Opt Autodesk. Yes, yes, I know. Yes, I know. Flare 2020.2 bin. There we go. Yada be. And then the application will start and you'll be left with uh, back here in Mac land, you'll have a shell that will give you all of your <laughs> feedback. So my little tip. You there. actually got a license, Andy. Oh yeah, I have a, a at home license, like checked out from, uh, from the office. Cool. Hell yeah. Um, but um, this was a perfect setup here. I have probably 29 versions of uh, flame and, and flare and flame assist and everything installed. I'm going to ask my first loaded question of the day here. Jack, is that a good idea? No, just <laughs> remove everything except for the versions you're actually running. And what I recommend is, is update all of your setups to the latest one, do a bit of housekeeping, remove, all of all of your old projects because what usually happens is is that if you don't remove the old projects they stay on the frame store so you've deleted the latest version of the project in let's say 
2020.3, you know, you've got the project in 2020.1 and 2020 because you haven't deleted it. Your space doesn't come back until you delete all of those earlier versions. Gotcha. Very good to know. And that also explains why, <laughs> why uh, <laughs> my Autodesk media storage folder is not releasing space no matter how often I delete the project. So I will, I know what I'm going to do as soon as we finish uh, this episode of Logic Live. Thank you, Jack. No worries. Um, any other tips? Oh, but actually, before I, I move on to that, in the chat here, there have been a couple of uh, little bits of feedback. I want to make sure everybody sees. Uh, Quinn has, uh, has brought up that um, he creates terminal aliases for, uh, for each project. If he's going to be working on a project on a Mac for a while. And then um, both Quinn and Miles here put uh, a link to the uh, Carabiner Elements, carabinerelements.pgrs.org, um, which is, um, Miles, help me out here. It's, it's, that's for um, keyboard mapping, right? So you can map your, your, uh, your WAN keyboard. Like if you wanted to switch the tilde key with the escape key, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Miles says, yes, thank you, Miles. All right, perfect. Um, Alan, is there anything you could recommend to, uh, to our users at home to help keep their- so Much uh, of my experience is in running a facility and not as a single person. So it's hard for me to sometimes give that type of advice, but we do all sorts of really interesting things here at Instinctual, things that generally people haven't thought were possible at all or used certain tools in, in really unique ways. Um, so I'd say like, you know, look at my videos, a lot of them show maybe not exactly how to do it, but what can be done. Um, but, you know, for us, the biggest thing is the stone FS because we have a centralized, we have a single centralized frame store that all of our machines utilize. So that separating all the stones makes it, that's like so crucial to reliability more than I think anything else that we do. Um, you know, going back to what you're just talking about, we keep very clean systems. So we don't have, you know, projects that are, uh, we don't have versions that go back too far. Autodesk includes at least on Linux a tool, a tool called RMSoft that makes it very convenient and safe to remove old versions. So we- Yeah, and, and the same with the Mac uninstaller, it is very safe. Yeah. You know, like I have never ever had a problem using RMSoft or the Mac uninstaller in all of my time um, and I just recommend it because if you've got multiple versions of the software there, you're always going to find someone or you who has something in the dock or logs into the wrong version and look, it just causes problems because people call up and they say, oh, this feature doesn't work. And I'm like, and it takes me, you know, the better part of half an hour to work out that they weren't in the version that they thought they were. They're in, you know, three versions behind. Once you're in flame, you've got no real way of working out which version you're in. Um, it all looks the same. It just doesn't have half the features which you're trying to use. <laughs> Very good point. Um, hey Andy, yeah. one, other, one other thing, and this is relevant to some other companies that I've seen. So again, this is more of a studio level, but uh, we run a single back burner manager instance and that's actually virtualized, it's not a physical machine. Um, if you're running any more than just one flame, make sure you really just have a single back burner manager. It's going to make oh, your life a lot, lot easier. Oh, it's definitely like, like if we're getting into the back burner level sort of stuff, um, you want either a virtual machine or a real machine running burn being your back burner manager. Because if you don't, it causes you so much pain. Yeah. 
And by default, manager is enabled on every flame install. So that's something you have to basically yeah. turn off afterwards. But you definitely yeah. want to do that. Well, you've got to actually be actively managing all of all of that stuff. As soon as you've got two flames, um, you want to back burn a manager running somewhere else. Yeah. Gotcha. So when you say uh, pain, can you be a bit more specific? Um, Backburner is a love and hate relationship. Uh, you love it because it looks after all of your imports and exports. But if you don't do it right, you just, people are calling you all day, every day saying, my media is not being cached or my media is not coming in and you spend all of your time logging into it and going, uh, something's not right here. And you, it takes time to actually work out what's going wrong. Gotcha. Is this, would that also apply if you had two flames that were running different OSs? Like if you had one Mac flame and one Linux flame, would it still be best to have one back burner running uh, on a third machine? doesn't matter if you're talking Mac or Linux. Okay. At the end of the day, um, Flame is Flame. It doesn't matter what OS you're running it on. Once you scratch a Mac with Flame installed, you're in Linux. Gotcha. Uh, Alan, and that's have... something which I... And that's something which I'd like to sort of tell everyone is that you don't have a Linux or a Mac running Flame. You are running Flame on hardware. They are exactly the same. Um, they are not different. Yeah, except one of them <clears throat> comes with seven hundred dollar wheels. I just want to just want to throw that out there. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I'm uh, me personally. I'm waiting for them for the refurbished wheels uh, to show up on the website before I buy my. <laughs> <clears throat> Should be six months. Um, Alan, uh, I know you you've done some uh, some great stuff with Backburner. Um, do you have videos showing that on your YouTube channel? Uh, the only video I've made so far in regards to the things that we've done with Backburner, I did kind of demonstrate using Backburner as a way to push install software. So that we oh, wow. do that through all our through, through all of our facility is because um, I have like 25 machines. Most of them are burns actually. Um, but now I can install any software I want all through a command to just utilize Backburner as the orchestrator to push all of those software updates to all the machines via Backburner. I demonstrated that. Uh, some of the other stuff that we do with Backburner is uh, wrote some software to monitor the queue. So if there's a, a burn job or a Maya job or a nuke job that was sent to the queue, it will automatically turn on all of the burn nodes or render nodes, because they're not just burn nodes at that point, the render nodes. And then when that job is finished after a specified amount of timeout, it will then automatically shut down those nodes. And that obviously saves on electricity, but also cooling costs. We're, mm -hmm. we're cooling constrained here. So that was a really big reason why uh, we wanted to keep those off as much as possible. Um, yeah, and then I don't know, we do a few other things, but those are like really the big innovative ones. But Backburn is really like, it's, it's simple, but there's actually some power there mm -hmm. um, if you utilize the API. Um, and, I'm, you know, the... One of the big things is right now the backburner monitor, which is the web interface that uh, we utilize, that we all do. It's currently flash based. So Autodesk has about seven or eight more months before flash is like literally killed from all browsers. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they do in that time to replace it. But that yeah. doesn't change the back end, mm -hmm. as far as I know, unless something changes. Well, uh, Dave from chat here is just asking, does it, do you need to have a powerful machine running Backburner? And I think the answer is no. If, As you said, it can be uh, a virtual machine, right? 
Yeah, if, if that question is in regards to the manager, no, it's, you'd be surprised the small machines that we use as virtual hosts, they're rather small. Um, as long as you're not doing the transcoding with Wiretap Central, that, that would require some CPU because it's doing actual yeah. transcoding. Mm -hmm. But for just manager itself, it could be quite low. And in fact, I run manager in a container now, which is even more lightweight. Yeah. Yeah, like the manager needs nothing. Um, but if you start using some of the features like transcode and wiretap central, but I don't know anyone using wiretap central anymore. Um, like no reason. Um, just run it through resolve. Got one more question for you guys. And that is, uh, let's say you wanted to run flame on a laptop. Uh, I know that there's a config out there. I think a supported one for, for installing Linux on, uh, on like an HP laptop. Um, if you're going to go the laptop route, is it worth it to go Linux or to dual boot on a, on a, a Windows machine or should you just go Mac? Depends. Um, I am the king of building, uh, laptops and have built them for Marcus in London. I've built three of them. I've got one sitting here waiting to be built. Um, it's, the, it's the way of the future. I am talking to Jan about actually getting these things properly certified. Mm -hmm. um, so that stuff installs properly, but you know, um, a Linux laptop with a 2080 card in it, but you've got to be the sort of operator who can actually troubleshoot your own setups. Okay. Um, if you expect it just to work, don't do it buy a Mac. Um, they're about the same cost, but you've got to be a little bit savvy about it. Um, if you hit the same three buttons every time, it's not for you. Gotcha. Good to know. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Jack Horace and Alan Letary. Thank you very much for joining us today on uh, this edition of Logic, uh, Logic Live Tech Talk. So I just want to let you guys know about some of our upcoming Logic Live sessions. I've got quite a few more to announce, which is great. But coming up next week, we have uh, CG compositing in Flame and color management with our good friend John Ashby, uh, followed by on May 3rd, writing Python scripts for Flame with uh, yours truly and my special guest, uh, Fred Warren, who's also my um, Python Sherpa. Uh, that's that's uh, Portuguese there. Um, on Sunday, May 10th, we're going to do a neat video deep dive uh, with with Tim just uh, just from Neat Video, uh, and uh, they have a, a little special promotion for our Logic Live viewers as well. On Sunday, May 17th, we're going to have an interview with Will Harris, Flame Family Product Manager. We'll talk about the new 2021 release. And uh, I think we're going to try to get a few more members of the dev team there as well. And uh, that should be fun. Followed up by May 24th, we're going to do Maya for Flame Artists with uh, Yuri Tempolsky, who's a, a Flame Artist from Sao Paulo. And on May 31st, uh, Brian Bailey from Treehouse in Dallas uh, is going to take us through Connected Conform for social deliverables. Uh, I personally would love to social distance from social deliverables, but if uh, we do have to do them, I'm glad that Brian has figured out a way to make it go a little smoother. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, again, a reminder, Logic Fest entries are due at 11.59.59 p.m. tonight. Definitely want to get in on that. Make sure you check out logic.tv for all of our Logic Live sessions and a bunch of other great resources. Uh, I'll get this one up there as soon as I possibly can. If you get a chance, head on over to uh, uh, our logic.tv uh, YouTube page and uh, hit subscribe. And also please go to Alan Letary's and hit subscribe. We want to get those numbers up as high as we can. I want to say thank you again to our new sponsor, Synesis Oceana. 
Uh, they're, like I've said at the top, they've been my uh, reseller for 15 years and we couldn't operate without them. And I just thank these guys for constantly supporting the, uh, the flame community. Uh, they've always supported one frame of white and, uh, and they, they, uh, help, they, sorry, they support user groups all over the place. And that is it, my friends. Thank you very much for joining us for this week's Logic Live. We'll see you next week.